Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Jackson Crawford. Sometimes, as you know on my channel, I like to introduce you to my favorite places and some of the fascinating people that I know. And today, I'm here at Long Shadow Holster in Lafayette, Colorado. So, Josh, you want to tell us a little bit about Long Shadow and how it came yeah, to be? Absolutely. Long Shadow started, like a lot of companies, in the garage out of necessity. I got into concealed carry in... Uh, 2009, 2010, prior to that I had military service and, and grew up in Montana where open carry was more preferred simply because there's a lot more um, four-legged animals up there that would come after you while we were hunting and hiking and whatnot than there were in, in places like San Diego and Florida where, where I lived in the military. Um, so out of essentially out of necessity, trying to get into products for concealed carry, which changed, you know, you, about that time, we were starting to see a lot of companies come up with inside the waistband holsters that were more comfortable, so on and so forth. Um, the problem at the time was simply that there was only a handful of companies that were producing fairly high quality product and their back times or wait times were super long and the products were extremely expensive. Uh, Raven, I believe, was the company that was kind of the creme de la creme at the time when we first started, when I started this in, in uh, the development process in 2012. Uh, holsters were the, the lead times. If I remember right at the time, Raven was at 16 weeks. Um, so, you know, I'm a handy guy. I've made a lot of things. I got online, did some research, bought some material, made uh, made a book press um, in, in the garage out of scrap I had. And since I had a bunch of carpentry style tools anyway, uh, I didn't really have to go buy any new equipment. So, uh, made my first holster. Uh, it was an abject failure. I put the gun in one time and couldn't get it out. I had to cut it out. Um, we've come a long way since then, um, but that, you know, there's no greater teacher than, than that. So um, that's really where it started. Once I had come up with, I think, my first two or three successful holsters, the gun club at the time, the Trigger Time Gun Club that I was attached to, um, a buddy of mine, Mark, was uh, the training instructor there. And then I knew the owner, Paul Gonzalez, and um, uh, the general manager, Zach Yarrow, pretty well. And they saw what I was producing, uh, and they had a need, timing was right. The producer that was making holsters for them, they weren't satisfied with the product or the business dealings and told me if I started making them that they would buy them. So Long Shadow was born essentially that day, hmm. which was October of, 20, uh, October of 2013. So what were your first product lines? So the very first product we made um, based on demand for the gun club was the Antero, which um, all of our, we started in Longmont, which is the name Long's Shadow comes from Long's Peak, which is uh, the 14,000 foot peak right outside of Longmont, which is what Longmont's named for. Um, and so we wanted a local reference, of course, Colorado at the time and a lot of other places were talking about uh, buy local initiatives. So having something that tied directly to the front range in Colorado made sense to us. Uh, and then each product line that's been introduced is named after a 14er, uh, which is a 14,000 foot peak. Colorado has 52 of them. So we started with the pancake design, uh, which pancake design holsters are going to have a, a front piece and a rear piece tied together essentially with back folded sides so it conforms to your hip. Because of that, this can be worn outside the waist with loops on the back, or we can remove those and put overhooks such as this product right here. Uh, this is an overhook design which can be put, put on, taken off uh, without removing your belt, we can actually attach those to the lower holes in the front of that same holster. Now you got an inside way. So it made a very versatile product out of the bat. You could go inside or outside uh, and carry that in you know, the manner that, that the user or customer decided. So that was the first product line. Um, what we tried to do to set ourselves against those that were out in the market was Instantly, we went to a thicker material. We started using a 0 0.093 inch material. Industry standard was 0.060 or 0.080. We did the thicker material, the adjustable retention, and then hardware selection was really key to make sure that that hardware stayed in the holster and didn't over time work itself loose or get lost. Uh, that was kind of a failing I was seeing in the industry in a lot of locations. So thicker material, adjustable retention, better hardware, that product, um, once we started showing that around and Trigger Time caught, caught eye of it, uh, it went like wildfire. So it was, uh, it was an instant start that started out as a hobby and it wasn't very long. By June of 2014, I quit my day job and went full time in Long Shadow. Awesome. So, so why Antero at first? What, was there something special about Mount Antero? 
Uh, I like fishing there. Okay. <laughs> that was, I mean, that, that, and to me, the name was, it was easily recognizable for a Colorado, um, for a Colorado company. Also, it just kind of rolls off the tongue, and Taro is a, you know, from a language thing, the one thing when you're choosing a product name, the more complicated it is, or the harder to pronounce it is, um, the, excuse me, the less likely it is to catch on, or people are going to understand it, or be able to, to articulate it. So there's a little bit of true science behind naming a product that that people are going to be able to pronounce easily that rolls off the tongue easily so so the next one is an a f a well pardon yeah. <laughs> no. yeah excuse me no. but but the inside the waistband holster the mm -hmm. laundry yes sir i always kind of wondered if the name had something to do with the fact that that's often someone's first 14er right quandary is kind of a an early 14er for a lot of hikers you know it it wasn't for me again it was about a name that, that rolled off the tongue for me, and, and also some personal experience. Uh, behind Quandary Peak, which is um, slightly south of the town of Breckenridge, Colorado, the actual approach to, to start climbing that mountain uh, takes you to a lake called Blue Lakes. Um, there's a, a reservoir that feeds water to that Frisco area and whatnot. Uh, but there's also some lower lakes, and it's a really beautiful camp spot. We drove by Quandary Peak all the time to go camping, and so that was just one that was familiar with me. Hmm. Um, if I was going to say the easiest 14er to name anything after, it has to be a super easy product, which was the was Mount Evans, oh, because right. you can drive right to the top. Yep. So, <laughs> uh, we did have an Evans line. It was our wallet. Uh, we still, although we do still produce that wallet, it's not on our regular list item at this point because there's so many other products out there that we're doing. Sure. Um, that wallet, although it's a great little Christmas item and, and a stocking stuffer, we don't see a tremendous amount of sales on that throughout the year. So, mm. you know, it's there. We'll still make them. But, but also, I guess if you're in a quandary, yeah, you yeah. might reach for your pistol in a quandary. And this is yeah. my own BP9L in a quandary from Long Shadow that uh, <laughs> was very helpfully dremeled for my uh, new SRO optic today. Yeah. Uh, we have, to date, somewhere around 20,000 duty holsters in the market. Uh, plus or minus a thousand in that range um, between Norwegian military, Norwegian police, special forces units overseas, as well as special forces units in the United States, as U.S. Marshal Special Operations Group team. Uh, we have about 80 different law enforcement agencies from Denver PD to Adams County, uh, Colorado Sheriff's Office, L.A. County Sheriff, LAPD, uh, the Border Patrol. I mean, the list kind of goes on and on um, of different units that we're supplying, U.S. Marshals. Um, standard U.S. Marshals, not just the SOG team, whether they're doing entry work or whether they're admin or detectives or investigators, we want to make sure that equipment works all the time. For one, we want to make sure they're going home to their families, and, and if they're thinking about something that's going on with their holster that's not operating exactly the way that it's supposed to, they're not in the fight, and if their head's not in the fight, they may not go home. Right. A lot of people are out there producing holsters. Some great, there's a lot of amazing talent industry. There's some of them that are just good enough and there's some of them out there that are likely items from either a, a theory standpoint or a design standpoint are probably not good things to carry, pure and simple. Um, what I wanted to define Long Shadow was from the get-go was superior materials, superior ergonomics, meaning making sure that that holster works exactly the way that it's supposed to. There's a lot of little features in these things that, uh, that if you don't do them correctly will cause the user problems, such as if you don't cut enough out of the trigger guard area, when you go to grab this gun and you reholster, it can pinch your finger significantly. You get little, uh, in fact, blood blisters, just like that one right there, from reholstering. Um, <laughs> providing some form of sweat guard to mitigate the possibility of moisture and rust when you're wearing this against your skin depending on the coating and where you are in the U.S. You know, in, in Northwest Montana, you're not going to sweat near as much as you would in, say, Southern Florida. Right. Um, materials, choosing the right materials, choosing the right type of coating on the hardware, choosing the right hardware to make sure that that always works. Um, that's what I'd like to say about Long Shadow is from the get-go, it was to make that product only we would carry. If you wouldn't carry it, we're not going to ship it out. So now someone wants a holster for a new gun to go to your website perhaps, or if they're in Colorado, they come here. What happens then? So really what it comes down to is uh, um, 
we redefined ourselves in 2017, 2018, instead of doing foam pressed one-off molds where we would take somebody's gun or a solid mold of a gun that was made by Blue, uh, Blue Guns or um, Tony Katner owns uh, multi-mold. There's a bunch of companies out there producing what we call a solid mold. Looks like a gun, some of them are de-featured to make good molds automatically for holsters. Others, we've got to tape and block items. Like if you pull this out, there's no way you'd get this light into a holster without first providing blocking that carries the highest points of this from, from here all the way back through the gun. So it used to be a pretty laborious process, anywhere between two and four hours on something like this to turn this into a mold. And then you take the hot material in a foam press, you pull it over, close it down and clamp it, and then cross your fingers that it comes out right. Okay, so that process of two to four hours, kind of depending on the setup, was, as you can imagine, laborious. If we're only pressing one holster, eventually we're just not going to be able to continue to create holsters for profit if you're doing that for every gun. Right. Or right. either that or employees are going to have to be really happy with 6 $7 an hour, which we know they're not. <laughs> so, so we made the decision and, and had some, some family infusion of capital and then had some, some investor infusion of capital in late 2017, early 2018, and we moved our entire process to vacuum forming, which, which we'll see in the shop when, when we walk you through that process. That allows us to create a very specific mold uh, and press multiple off that same mold over and over again, maximizing both the profit as well as the ability to pay our employees more than $7 an hour. So um, because of that, we cannot accommodate every gun in every situation. However, um, we do provide, at least right now, last we, we went through the website, somewhere around 3,000 different iterations of our products across those lines. Uh, if there's enough demand for something that we don't have, we kind of track that based on requests and phone calls. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And things we want to get into, as yeah. well as those manufacturer relationships we have. And we'll go after those molds. If we cannot uh, purchase those molds from a mold maker, we are now in the process of developing our own mold lines as well. With a, we've got a 3D scanner, we've got a, uh, the, the CAD software, Fusion 360, we're utilizing for that. We've got a CNC machine that sits back there and looks really good now. Yeah. Pretty quick for to use it. Yeah. So we're gonna be making our own. There's no one size fits all. We make, I think, seven different designs now. We have our, pardon me, we have our Quandry, our Quandry C. Quandry light bearing appendix, our Antero, uh, our Creston L2, the Huron in both a competition mode or model as well as the Huron in a tactical or, or carry mode. We have our San Luis sidecar, which of course is another IWD product. We publish our phone number. We, and it's on every social media platform. You'll see our address, our phone number, our email, and our hours of operation. We want people to call in and ask those questions right. so that when they walk away with their holster, they know exactly what they're getting into. Right. Uh, in this day and age where everybody texts or sends an email and does everything via that or just wings it, um, I absolutely want to talk to those customers. I want them to call and I want them to ask as many questions as they can so we can work them through the process of defining what's going to work for them best. If they come into the store, they can try them on. Right. You know, we've got over 500 products in stock of all various types. It may not be theirs. I mean, it may not be their exact gun. We can put them into something fairly close. They'll get a feel for it before they buy, and then we can get that product made for them. Well, and I think it's awesome that all of this started right here in Colorado and is still done right here in Colorado, yep. right here yep. in the shop in Lafayette. Well, now, will you take us back and show us exactly from start to finish how yep. a holster gets made? Absolutely. Let's do it. We're going to go through printing a uh, holster using sublimation printing. So what we've done is we've, we've modified or created a flag. In this case, it was an open source flag on the internet. We turned it into an assaulting flag because we're going to be printing on clear today. We want to print on one side and then have that picture visible through the holster. It gives it an, an image or a, 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 it gives it depth is the best way to put it. So we're good to go. In this case, what we're going to do is just allow that to dry just slightly. So we're going to lay that on there in such a way that we've got complete coverage. Cut off the excess, which the only thing the excess would do is actually dye the, the uh, pads inside our press, and then it would transfer to other products that we don't want to do that with it. So we'll flip that back over. Right now we're at 355 for 260 seconds on this heat press, which is just a standard t-shirt press. 
here. We're gonna lay that in. We'll grab our silicone membrane. With clear, we have found that there's some dead spots that happen. So we double up our membrane on the clear and that seems to give us the best results for printing. And we're locked in 355 degrees for 240 seconds. When it's done, it'll beat, we'll peel it off. All right, so here we are, we're done. We're gonna peel that out. Yeah, just throw that over. Lay this down so we don't burn ourselves. And what I'm gonna do, because I have to use my hands, I can't use gloves, I'm gonna slowly peel this off we'll see that we have sublimated or transferred that image onto the material. So we'll pull that down, face down, and let her cool. This is our custom-made three-port vacuum table. So we're gonna do, in this case, it's 389 degrees, 110, or 120 seconds, pardon. And we're gonna do that with our finished edge down so we don't melt, burn, or anything like that. Put it in. Right now we're at about 120 seconds. It'll go through, it'll heat all the way up. We'll peel that off. We're gonna lay that directly over the top of the vacuum port of the mold, or and the mold, and then we're gonna use a foam membrane to pull the vacuum on that unit and form to our mold. As it cools, it'll become rigid, and then we're ready to start the holster process of cutting it down, folding it, and making the holster. All right, so we're hitting our temp. We're gonna raise that up. Peel that sucker off slowly. Make sure we've got what we need there and that. Then we're going to lay that directly over the top of the product. Pull it down so we can get our pattern exactly the way that we want it. In this case, there. We're going to lay our membrane over the top of that. Frame it. Okay, we'll just reset that. We're going to come through on what we call a double holdover because that material, for one, is super hot. Um, we want to make sure that it has time to cool. We're going to kill our membrane, or our vacuum, pardon me. Take our frame, slowly peel this off. We get to see those results. Now what we'll do is we'll kill this machine, the pump, and kick our fans back on to continue to cool it, because it's not totally cool, but you can start to see what that's going to look like. So it's been pulled very well all the way into the recesses. We've got full coverage around the trigger guard, around the muzzle, and above. So we can use our cutoff jig and make sure that this holster is going to uh, have the proper coverage all the way around. All right, so that's cool. Just going to slowly peel that off, working it up around all the verticals that were created with the blocking. The Pale Horse does a really good job with his molds. He puts angles on the outset to make that easier to pull off. But anytime you have verticals around blocking, it's still going to require some some movement in here to get that off. There we go. There we go. Mold is done. And for uh, for large production days, we can use all four ports, two presses, two pumps with two kickstands or two uh, kickstarts, and pump out somewhere between 150 and 200 products a day just on this vacuum table set. All right, so we've got our pressed holster, um, and now it's time to kind of cut out the, the material that we're gonna need in order to use the finished product. In order to use, do this, we're gonna use this router jig. Um, this is what we utilize to get the same exact shape for every single holster that we make. Um, so this will actually fit right into this material. Fits like a glove, doesn't move around. And then we just take a white pencil and we draw a line all the way around the router jig. And that's gonna give us just our rough shape of what we want the end product to look like. Um, so we have our rough shape now drawn onto the holster. Um, next step's pretty simple. We're just gonna use a bandsaw to uh, follow the line and, and cut out the pieces of material that we need in order to make a fully functional holster. Um, so we'll do that now. You wanted a talon retention system. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and mark the drill locations for the hole pattern on that hanger. So we just make a little mental note in the form of, of white markings so that uh, you know if we set this down and someone else picks it up, they know exactly what's going on with it. Um, pretty simple. 
So our whole pattern is now drilled. One of the ways in which we go the extra mile is we realize there's a lot of different hangers that can go on this holster. There is a very real possibility that our customers will be pulling hangers off and putting new ones on. So in order to make that as nice as possible, we actually will come in and countersink all of uh, the holes that we drill. There's kind of some sharp edges on there now. Um, and we just like to pay attention to the little things. So we're gonna break that down on this drill press. And now we're ready to router. How many holes does it work on on a regular day? Uh, usually in a batch binder, we, we uh, break our batch binders down to 20 holsters per binder. Um, that way we can keep everything organized and everything ran through. Um, so we have sections of batch binders, uh, typically 20 orders a binder um, that we run through on a daily basis. And those orders, are they categorized by type of gun, type of holster? Um, no, it just... Uh, we just usually, whatever. yeah, just whatever customers are ordering in um, is what we uh, will produce. Um, we do some overbuilds, so we have stuff in stock, uh, but other than that, yeah, it's a, usually a typical day is just uh, orders getting pushed through for customers. And it's ready to go for router cut, which is going to give us our final edge. These router jigs we make from our mold pressings. Um, we actually make a perfect pressing and then backfill it with alumilite. We've got a small roller bearing we're going to run against the outside of our cutoff jig on the router bit. We use a four blade, uh, three eighths inch carbide router bit that's used for solid surface. And so far this has been the best cutter we've had. We've got a um, cyclonic dust collection system on this. It's gonna suck up some of the dust, but it still should, it still is gonna come across our super high end, um, you know, very well engineered cardboard box uh, blocky thingy. That looks like German cardboard. Yeah, you look at that, it, it could be. <laughs> German cardboard. All right, here we go. See, we've cut to those final dimensions and we're ready to go to the next step, which is going to be to fold that over the firearm. We've got our, our actual P30 firearm, which is safe and unloaded. And we've got our folding jig. This is a multi-mold jig, um, similar to how we started in the industry with a blue gun or another firearm uh, drone, if you will, that's, that's made to what would be as close to the specific dimensions of the firearm. In this circumstance, we've actually put a slight taller blocking on it so we can get that suppressor height sight blocking channel for those that are running suppressors or co-witnessed uh, sights for red dot optics, such as what is displayed on this HKVP9 log. So we increase the height of that by using very technical pieces of um, <clears throat> uh, barbecue skewers and uh, chopsticks. And then industry standard is to use this uh, HVAC tape. It actually makes a very slick, very smooth, but it builds it up to be exact dimension. So we always measure the distance side to side of the slide and then top of the slide to bottom rail and whatnot to ensure that our drones are good because we want to make sure that that fitment's right on. We're going to go ahead and set that right there in the middle and let that get hot. We can actually fold this around the gun and depending on the thickness of material and the thickness of the sight blocking, get a perfect channel to go ahead and press that down into it. A lot of this is subjective. You're going by feel and look, the, the, the changes that are made in that material as you heat it up. Uh, if it glazes, it gets really super shiny. That means we've overheated it and that can cause weakness in that joint or in that fold. So the idea here is just to move it back and forth, get some heat on that, make sure it's uniform and soft enough to go ahead and press into that folding channel to make a good uniform fold. Okay, we're hot. I'm going to lay that directly over the top of the gun, pulling it up into the trigger guard location, making sure it's centered. Grab it with a clamp there, or a clamp on the muzzle. Very likely we're going to be good to go in this second slot. And we'll set it in there and press that down. So what we've done with that, as you can see, is folded uniformly around that firearm in order to create that fold. And now we're starting to look like an actual holster at this point. What we're going to do here is the band belt sanding. All this is going to do right off the bat is we're going to clean this fold joint up right here on the nose of the holster and then just make sure we're mated all the way around the edges so it's real quick and dirty. When we did our folding jig, there's just a slight amount of slag on one side compared to the other. This is going to make that look uniform, give us our final shaping on the belt sander. All right, so we'll move directly over to the next stage. 
And this is using a very fine Scotch-Brite wheel. That's as, about as far as we can go without getting into some complex angles and otherwise within this drum set. We do have a narrow wheel over here, but in this case, the way this holster is cut, we're not really going to utilize it. So now we'll go on to hand sanding. So what we're doing now is we're moving on to hand sanding. Now we've eliminated a lot of the hand sanding with a very fine wheel on our drum station. Uh, and then the, of course the Dremel is for any complex angles. But when it comes down to it, a lot of the edge finish on this is not quite where we need it. When you're talking about the Heckler & Koch P30 series or VP9 series, we've got, um, which is not traditional to typical American firearms, is a paddle magazine release. What that does is it creates a situation with this firearm where we need to have clearance to be able to get to that while the gun is in the holster. That's one of our design features that we chose to do is to make sure that people can do admin checks, count rounds they've got while the gun's in the holster without pulling it out. Each time we pull a gun out of a holster, you have the possibility of something getting into that trigger guard and, and discharging that weapon, whether it's negligent, accidental, or otherwise, uh, keeping it in the holster makes it safer to do those checks. So anyway, our, our design, again, we're gonna have, in this case, we're gonna have that uh, cut out so that we can reach those either uh, thumb or finger uh, for this particular style of firearm. When you do that, we're actually creating complex angles in here that can be pretty sharp. And whether you're a 18 year old special forces badass or a 92 year old lady trying to protect herself, we want to make sure that that holster fits the gun properly, but also that you're not going to cut yourself every time you pull your gun out. So we'll use 150 grit sandpaper and just work our way in those complex angles to get rid of that burr, make it smooth to the touch, and uniform around the entire outer edge of this particular holster. So all we're doing now is blowing the dust off this. So what we've done, we've got the sanding process, so pressing, uh, drilling, cutting, routering, folding, sanding, the, the three sanding processes, which of course is the belt sand, the drum sand, and then hand sanding to get to this. At this point in time, we're gonna take a, a towel that's been pre-soaked with an oil to wipe the whole holster down that'll collect any dust. It'll also show us that edge finish that we got and see if there's any areas of improvement we need to make. And it does also have a small added benefit of providing us a, um, a nice shine. And that Looks good. Now, if we're going to come around and inspect that edge, we've got a good, clean, uniformed edge with no machine marks. We are ready to go ahead and build that holster out. We're going to use a Talon retention belt slide. It's a great little device made by Warren, a buddy of mine up in, in Montana that uh, is another holster maker, uh, designed these. They're an extremely simple product but it provides you a lot of use. Uh, you get a 1.5 inch belt loop, a 1.75 belt loop, attachment locations for either tech locks or other type of quick detach products, but also the ability to tilt that holster forward, straight up and down, or to the rear. So, so it's one we use regularly. All right, so when we're building our adjustable retention, the molds, this particular mold was purchased from uh, Pale Horse Concealment. He has developed what we, uh, what we put in the industry or what he's called a, a quarter inch gap. So what they do is when he's designing from a real firearm uh, in, in his CAD and CAM system is he'll actually take the firearm once he deconstructs it and, and splits it laterally to lay on a board in that space uh, on CAD system. When I believe he uses Fusion 360 or something similar. He actually sinks that whole thing once it's split directly into the board an eighth inch on either side to give us that quarter inch retention adjustment. In this case, when we're building these out, in order for you to have a wide range of adjustment uh, for a long shadow holster, I want you to be able to make it so loose the gun comes out with no resistance or so tight it becomes difficult to remove the firearm. So because we've got a quarter inch space, what we utilize is a 3 8 inch rubber grommet. We will take our, in this case, we're gonna use quarter inch binding posts for the adjustable retention. There's one there and one there. One of those will be our logo button. So we use a finish washer, which is a steel finish washer that's black oxide coated with an eighth inch rubber grommet. And then in this case, we're gonna start with, we'll do a three quarter inch on the bottom 
uh, and we'll start with a three quarter inch on the top. We may have to adjust that based on retention once we get the feel for it. And of course this is for you. So you'll get to do the adjustment fitting, make sure it fits the way you want it before we're done with it. Now, because we're using rubber in this particular circumstance, and because this is not a duty holster, and the user has the ability to tilt this holster one way or another, we don't typically lock tight hmm. our Hurons, our, our adjustable retention units, or things where there is the ability for the user to, to modify that angle or otherwise. For our duty gear, every single part, with the exception of the adjustable retention, is, has Loctite applied. The idea there is to make sure that for duty folks, law enforcement, security, or otherwise, they can count on that gear to not come apart ever. Okay, we've got that good and done. As far as the tension goes, you've got the correct angle on there for you to get that slight forward cant. There's our retention, or our, pardon me, our firearm comes in, and that holster is ready to go on final inspection and go out the door. Beautiful. Well, Josh, thanks so much for this awesome holster. Thanks for showing us how it's made. Thanks for telling us about this great Colorado company. Is there anything else you'd like to tell people? I'd like to say thank you. The opportunity was great. I appreciate you coming in here and allowing us to show you the process and work through a holster for you in that. Um, to reach out to Long Shadow Holster, we're open Monday through Friday from 8 to 4 at uh, 275 Wanaka Parkway, Suite 3E in Lafayette, Colorado. Uh, you can also reach us by phone number 720-453-3903 or check out our website www.lsholster.com. Great. Thank Thanks. you very much. And uh, to everybody else, all the best from beautiful Colorado.